But that was the beginning of the third phase of string theory. Okay, so here's where we are. Uh, this picture, we started off in this corner with hadrons being strings, and then, then hadrons turned to be quarks and gluons. Okay, too bad, but maybe gravitons are strings, well, super strings, maybe everything's super strings. Got to figure out the compactification issue, though, and we're sort of stuck on that one. But now we discover that, boy, even, this, even what we thought we knew isn't true. There's, there's a lot of richness here. Turns out all the string theories are quantum equivalent. And for the next two and a half years, there was a breakthrough every six months, almost like clockwork. People discovered something called D-brains. They were an essential part of string theory, but essentially missed. Um, black holes. People learned new things about black holes. The old problem, why does a black hole have entropy? Well, at least in some contexts in string theory, you can count all the states and figure out why there's entropy there, and you can get the number right. String theory was even, people found ways of reformulating the theory using these new D-rays. Okay, the details don't matter. The point is these were really spectacular breakthroughs. And they started having very significant impact on mathematics. There's an arrow, it was an arrow from compactification that sort of went back and forth. It was cross-talk between the mathematicians and the physicists. Well, now it started being a flood out of the physics into mathematics. And this continues to this day. This was really the beginning of string theory as applied to mathematics, giving mathematicians all sorts of new insights and ideas, overturning things that they thought they knew for many, many years. And uh, this, was, this was really an important development in that field. Now, by 1996, I had moved to the Institute for Advanced Study, where Witten works and where Cyber by that time had moved. So I was watching this, but not working on it. On the other hand, it started to be the case that string theory, with the developments in string theory were so powerful, they started then having implications for quantum field theory. And I realized, oh boy, I better learn this stuff better. <laughs> so I, I, I did actually work a bit on, on uh, some of the string theory applications to quantum field theory at that point. But the really amazing thing happened in 1997, when Juan Malvasena, who was I don't know, 31 at the time, perhaps. Um, uh, he, I knew him when he was a graduate student. He was a few years younger than me. And he went off to, he, he was a professor at Harvard by this point. He showed that quantum field theory in four dimensions and string theory in 10 dimensions are the same theory. Well, precisely, to be precise, he conjectured it, but he gave some very strong evidence. Quantum equivalence of quantum field theory and string theory. This was a shock. I mean, that's not supposed to happen, right? These are different theories, right? And, well, are you sure they're different? If quantum field theory is a little different, can be the same. If string theory is a little different, can be the same. Maybe theories in different dimensions with different properties altogether, one with quantum gravity, one without. Maybe they can be the same. Well, it seems to be true. So we come to the conclusion that strings are the same as quantum field theory, which is completely bizarre, but it has some very important implications immediately. And implications that interested me very much. Let's go back to 1968. Hadrons didn't turn out to be strings, but on the other hand, the string theory fits some of the data. So why is that? Well, maybe this is why, but on the other hand, um, what, was, what, was, what were people doing wrong 30 years ago? If there is a connection between hadrons and string, what was the problem in 1968? Well, the problem was that they very naturally since they were doing scattering experiments in four dimensions, they were living in four dimensions. Everybody knows if you're doing four dimensions, you should write down a four-dimensional theory. And so they were writing down theories of four-dimensional strings, which don't make sense. They're not consistent. They didn't know that then. So you had to go through this 25 years of development to figure out, well, the theory has to be ten-dimensional, and we need to learn all sorts of things about its properties. And at the very end of the game, you realize, oh my goodness, quantum field theory is related to string theory in extra dimensions. Hadrons, from this point of view, are strings in extra dimensions, not in four, but more. And the really magical thing is that it's not either or. It's and. Both of these things are true. Well, I've been working on this for several years. There's a lot coming out of it these days. Let me mention a couple of other things that were implications at that time. First of all, um, well, I should say, I guess, uh, uh, it was at this point that I got myself a professorship position at UPenn and then moved to UW a couple years later based on the kinds of things I was doing in, in, on, this, uh, on this subject. Um, now, on top of that, there were 
simply string theory as an inspiration to people who weren't working in string theory turned out to be really quite remarkable as well. Particle physics. Even, without pe even for people who weren't doing string theory, got very excited because people were inspired by string theory and had some very good ideas. And I can tell you about those if you like. And, oh yeah, what about the super duper string theorists? After all, a lot of the super duper string theorists were working on all this fancy stuff because they wanted to solve that problem of compactification. They wanted to find the theory of everything and figure out um, what string theory was going to predict for them. And so all these new developments came along, and now there were way too many possibilities. They discovered trillion, no, not trillion, no, exponentially large numbers of new ways of doing compactifications. And that's where we are. <laughs> okay, so that is my history tour. So take a look at it. We went around in a big circle with a nice big explosion in the middle and with big implications. Look at all those arrows, okay? There are implications for the super duper strength theorists over here, and those don't look so good, but there's also lots of good implications for the mathematicians, good implications for the particle physicists, good implications for the particle physicists, and good implications for people like me trying to understand uh, hadronic physics, for example. Okay, so it's a very weird story. But history, you know. History is pretty odd. And, and so let me just quickly run you through it one more time. That'll be the end of my little talk here. So remember, string theory started out of hadronic physics data. That's where it began. Didn't work for hadronic physics very well, so then it got turned into a theory of quantum gravity, and the extra dimensions which were required turned out to be actually good for trying to build a theory of all particles, forces, and space-time, or a theory of everything. By 1983, when mathematical consistency tests were passed, People got very excited, and this culture of super-duper string theorists formed. People who believed that that theory was going to give them the answer, and they found the right theory, and it was no longer necessary to ask the experimentalists for more help. Experimentalists were just going to confirm that the theory was right. It was just a matter of time, once they did enough calculations. But the problem was there were too many compactifications, too many possible worlds, they needed better techniques to choose the right one. They got the new techniques in 1995, these were great, they had considerable impact in mathematics, in quantum field theory, in particle physics, they continue to this day, and in fact it now allows contact between string theory and hand-run physics in data, and I'm proud to say that a lot of that work's being done here. So the theories come full circle, but unfortunately for the super-duper string theorists, the new method didn't help at all, it helped make things worse. And so here the super string theorists are, they've worked very hard, and they have a candidate theory for all particles, forces, and space-time, which they are now forced, even themselves, to admit is not very likely to make uniquely stringy predictions about the particles, forces, and aspects of space-time that we should expect in nature. Now, uh, a lot of us have been expecting this. Uh, if you knew a lot of quantum field theory, and some of the string theorists did and some of them didn't, uh, you know that quantum field theory doesn't easily make unique predictions, and so there's a lot of subtleties there, and the string theorists were just completely ignoring that. So it was not very surprising, but don't count these people out. They're very smart, and it may turn out that they were just trying to do the wrong thing. And string theory may have other classes of testable predictions, even if it can't predict all the particles and the forces. And furthermore, even if they fail, and even if they have failed, one also has to keep in mind they've made great contributions to theoretical and even now experimental physics, mostly indirectly, but nonetheless, seriously. And some notable individuals have uh, made very important direct contributions to quantum field theory even though they spend most of their time doing string theory. Now, I think it's a good thing that even a lot of die-hard, super-duper string theorists are coming to the conclusion that they probably need more data. And the good news is, the data's coming. So, I'll stop here. Thanks.